गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून आई एम प्रिंसिपल प्रोफेसर बसवराज ऑफ श्री जगत गुरु रेणुकाचार्य कॉलेज ऑफ साइंस आर्ट्स एंड कॉमर्स बेंगलोर द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जुअलॉजी अंडर द लीडरशिप ऑफ डॉक्टर सागरिका एज ऑर्गेनाइज एन इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार ऑन प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ डायलिसिस वी हैव इनवेटेड मिस्टर मंजुनाथ रेड्डी alumnus of sjr college is a senior clinical renal physiologist acland district health board of new zealand so i request uh, i welcome the guest all the faculties and my dear friends now i request uh, dr sagarika to introduce the chief guest dr sagarika ಪೂರ್ಣಿಮಾ ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ವಾರ್ಮ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ಲೇಜರ್ ಟು ಬೀಸ್ ರಿಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಮಂಜುನಾ ಅಂತ Mr. Manjunath Reddy did his B.Sc. from Shri Jagadguru Renukacharya College, Bangalore, Postgraduate Diploma in Dialysis Theory, uh, Therapy from Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. He obtained his Master's in Health Science from Auckland University, New Zealand. He is the first Indian certified hemodialysis technologist to be appointed in Auckland. in 1997 green line satellite hemodialysis unit was established along with his colleagues to train patients in hemodialysis for home treatment in 2001 along with his colleagues nephrologists and clinical directors mr manjunath formed a board of technologists in new zealand by name bonnet usa bonnet stands for board of nephrology examiners nurses and technologists this is for the yearly certification of the technologists nurses and others with a brief introduction he has many more accomplishments but i am restricting myself to this i request uh, mr manjunath to take over thank you sir thank you all namaskara ellarguno nan hesaru manjunath anta nan auckland new zealand inda maatadta idene iga namge samaya 8 gante 40 nimisha 8 40 pm on thursday evening so thank you very much everybody thank you for all the listeners all over the world so today i am talking about principles of hemodialysis first in the principles of hemodialysis i am going to talk about the functions of the kidneys acute kidney failure chronic kidney failure initiations of dialysis renal replacement modalities so in the functions of the kidney anatomy of the kidneys functions of the kidneys investigations of the kidneys i'm going to talk about 
So you all know there's a major internal human organs. There's a lungs, heart, spleen, pancreas, liver, and the kidneys. So there will be two kidneys in every human body. So if you can see, the, the diagram of the kidney where the, the supply of the blood is going to from the artery, aorta to the renal artery and to the renal vein and through the interior vena cava and to the urethra. So the kidneys in the, so this is the structure of the uh, kidneys where the um, supply of the blood, I'm going to explain about the kidney blood supply. The aorta branches into the renal artery, which supplies arterial blood to the kidneys. The renal artery divides into the interpolar arteries that pass between the pyramids through the through the renal columns and the arteries branch from the interpolar arteries to the boundaries of the cortex cortex and the medulla so the, the number of arteries branch from articulate arteries into the cortex and subdivide into the afferent arter arterioles so if you, this is the functional unit of the kidneys where constituents of the nephron. So the, the afferent arterioles deliver blood into glomerulus. So the glomerulus is here and the capillary network that produces and blood filtrate that enters the urinary tubules. The blood remaining in the glomerulus here will be lived through the efferent arteriole and deliver the blood into the another capillary network. So we're talking about the renal function. So is to remove and to regulate. The main re renal functions are the excretion of to remove the waste products and remove excess fluid concentration and dilution of urine, regulation of acid-base balance, excretion of hydrogen ions and conservation of bicarbonate, regulate electrolyte levels. And also in the secretion it says regulate blood pressure and renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. And also it regulates red blood production that's called erythropoietin called EPO and also it regulates calcium calcium uh, intake so it calcium intake in the body so who will diagnose you as a, as your kidney problems a nephrologist or a renal specialist will diagnose and ask you to check your blood blood samples for uh, serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen and acid base um, acid base status and pH status bicarbonate levels and serum phosphate levels and the hemoglobin and also you will check you will ask you to check the urine for 24 hours creatinine excretion that means they calculate the creatinine clearance in the urine and there's protein loss in the urine. Yeah. And and also and also the red blood cells and the white blood cells loss in the urine. And also the renal specialist or the kidney specialist will tell you to check the X-ray of the urinary flow. So in that urinary flow, when they do the ultrasound, they check the size of the kidneys and, 
and the blood perfusion. Uh, that means they check uh, how good is the uh, kidneys working and what is the size of it, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a shrinking or anything. And also the the third one is the isotope imaging. In the isotope imaging also, they, what they do is they, they pass you a dye, called some chemical dye on the um, um, bloodstream. And then they ask you to wait and they do the scan and they check your size of the kidneys and the glomerular filtration rate. And the blood pressure perfusion, they'll exactly know how good is your kidneys working. And now we nearly did the summary function of the kidneys, like we already did the anatomy and the physiology and the investigations. Now, acute and chronic kidney failure or a renal failure. So they check the general patho pathophysiology underlying diseases. The acute renal failure. Acute means it's mostly reversible decrease in the renal function that means large or normal kidneys the symptoms are the decrease in urinary output lesser than 500 ml per day and increase in serum urea or creatinine etc classification the pre renal function disturbance due to decreased blood perfusion dehydration and shock. So this can be happen in, in case of accidents or when the patients are sick or when they are in the intensive care or something like when they are really sick, they have always have this problem. And the renal kidney damage is due to decreased blood perfusion, inflammation, toxicity. Toxicity might, might be happening due to high uh, drug overdosage or something like that. And example, glomerulonephritis. A post renal kidney damage is due to increased pressure of the urinary flow obstruction. So, what are the causes for the main acute renal failure? Main cause is reduced kidney perfusion, low blood pressure, as I said, like post-surgery, where the patients are having uh, intensive care problems, as sepsis or multi-organ failure, they always have the inter acute renal failure. The treatment is intermittent continuous hemodialysis or hemofiltration. Sometimes they'll be having a lot of uh, fluid in their body, so they ask you to do the hemodialysis. And fluid balance, monitoring of electrolyte, infection control, infection control, treatment of underlying disease. And the mortality rate is 50 to 80 percent due to the underlying diseases. And the other one is chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure is a irreversible decrease in glomerular filtration due to loss of nephrons and the small kidneys. So what are the symptoms for the chronic renal failure? The symptoms for chronic renal failure are generally fatigue, mental disturbance and anorexia, anosia, vomiting and nervousness nervous system is insomnia and polyneuropathy. In the blood, they usually animate. Their blood, their blood count will be very low. And bleeding tendencies, they will always have a bleeding either in the nose or um, usually on the urine. And cardiovascular problems are hypertension and oedema. Oedema means the fluid accumulated in the all parts of the body like mainly in the legs. You can see the legs, legs are swollen for the kidney failure patients. 
and the bone uh, decalcifications of the bone. So, um, so what is the uh, decalcification? Is the loss of calcium from the bone, and usually the chronic renal failure patients will have the discoloration of the skin to yellowish color. Like if you see them, um, the dialysis patients or the patients looks like uh, yellowish in color, like jaundice and everything. And they always have uh, itching, high amount of itching because of uh, high uremic uh, uh, urea in the blood. So if you see the map, the main cause of uh, the um, chronic renal failure are called ESRD, that's called end stage renal disease, is mainly caused by diabetes and hypertension. So mainly if you see the rate million per year is the highest in the diabetes. And if you see the hypertension, the people with uh, high blood pressure will also have the problem of kidney failure. And also the glomerulonephritis uh, is one of the other diseases and also uh, cyst cystic kidneys and other urological problems. The other problems also is the people smoking and uh, they're not following the healthy diet and uh, not taking uh, proper medications, what the um, no, nephrologist told you. And usually, even if the nephrologist say one one medication, and they will be kept on taking their own uh, medication. So mainly, so how do you treat? So the treatment one is underlying disease is to take proper uh, insulin, antihypertensive, immunosuppressions, etc. So, retardations of progress. So, usually the, the blood pressure, normal blood pressure is 120 by 80. Uh, for once they come to the renal failure people, they are considered to be 130 over 90. Uh, they, they need to bring it down to one to, you know, usually their blood pressure will be very high. So, they want to keep it control of the blood pressure by giving ACE inhibitors therapy in case of proteinuria. Proteinuria means, sir, first again, excuse me, first again, I'm okay? That's right, sir. So, ACE so, inhibitors therapy in case of proteinuria. So, dietary protein restrictions. So dietary means like they they will restrict all the protein diet. They don't want to take any protein diet, and they need to cease all the smoking. No drugs are with negative effects on the kidneys. Like uh, they want to take uh, paracetamol, heavy dose of paracetamol because they got a headache and all sort of things. So it dissolves the negative effects on the kidneys. And treatment of intercurrent diseases like urinary infection, diarrhea, etc. Treatment two. So usually there will be uremic disorders like bone disease, phosphate binders. So they need to take that one properly. And also the metabolic, metabolic acidosis and sodium bicarbonate PO and, and Anemia, like uh, for anemia, they do the they they do inject the injection called erythropoietin. These days, they don't do uh, uh, transfuse much of the blood transfusion, so they give the erythropoietin injection. And prevention of uh, malnutrition, adequate diet, prevention of hyperkalemia. So for once they diagnose this uh, chronic renal failure they stop giving all the most of the fruits because they contains high level of uh, 
potassium. Uh, for example, in, in India, when they are sick, uh, you know what they do, they give you the tender coconuts. So for the dialysis patient or the kidney failure patients, it's very high risk because the kidney, the tender coconut contains high uh, potassium uh, inside that drink. So that's the poisonous drink for the uh, kidney failure patients. And the cardiovascular risk factors, anti-hypertensive therapy. So sodium restriction, that means anti-hypertensive, they, they put them on the blood pressure pills because their blood pressure will be rocket high, like very high, like 200 plus, 200 over 120, like when they are diagnosed as the chronic renal failure or chronic kidney failure. And they will put them on the lipid disorders. Acute and chronic renal failure. So, so we already discussed about the acute onset due to acute kidney damage. Most frequent cause is reduced blood pressure due to surgery or a sepsis or an accident and due to multi-organ failure. But usually the acute renal failure can be reversible. And it's also high mortality, not from kid kidney failure, but from the comorbidity. In chronic renal failure, incidence onset, so progression to end stage renal disease. It's called small kidneys. So frequent causes like, uh, because what is the causes for this renal failure? Mainly it's diabetes mellitus, hypertension. The progression can be slowed down by medical treatment. For example, diabetes and hypertension. If the patient is referred timely to a specialist. So what is the initiation of renal replacement therapy? A solute indication, relative indication, recommendations, and late referrals. Absolute indication for initiation of dialysis is pericarditis, advanced of progressive uremic encephalopathy, encephalopathy and or neuropathy, pulmonary edema and fluid overload, unresponsible to diuretic measures. So pulmonary edema has been full of fluid around the lungs. So edema means fluid, or swelling, sorry. So they won't be responding to any diuretic. Diuretics is the medication given to um, the urine to drain. Like, and hypertension poorly responsive to the treatment. And also when these people are in the initiation of dialysis, they will be very sick, like uh, hyperkalemia, like they eat all sorts of kind when, when the kidneys are not functioning, the blood uh, chemistries will go high like uh, potassium in the blood and urea in the blood and everything. So there'll be a lot of bleeding diathesis with clinical bleeding attributed to the uremia because the urea is more so they always have the bleeding tendencies in their nose, uh, mouth, everything and always they'll be nauseated. Relative indication for initiation of dialysis. The general indications are anorexia, fatigue, weakness, and when the serum creatinine is more than 12 milligrams per deciliter, and the blood urea is more than 100 milligrams per deciliter. So what is the blood urea nitrogen is the, another waste product. So neurologically, like peripheral neuropathy, often burning uh, diarrhea and single tears and restless red syndrome, syndrome. Cardiovascular and peripheral edema and responsible to diuretics. So they will always have the heart problems when they diagnose the 
kidney failure relative indication of initiation of dialysis gastro intestinal gastro intestinal anorexia progressing to nausea and vomiting gastritis duodentitis constipation ascites without liver disease and hemato- hematological issues are anemia with poor response to erythropoietin increased infections increased bleeding due to platelet dysfunction that means their platelet counts will be very low so they will always have a bleeding tendencies derma dermatological that means their skin will be very itching and you can see all the screens with uh, dot dots of all uh, itching um, you can see like um, tumba scratch markonde id martta and dystrophic calcification because their calcium will be very low and uh, they have a lot of uh, calcification on the skins and you can see the white patches and gulagal tar bandirutte ella so usually when when the initiations of dialysis they do the urine test and also the blood test for the past 3 uh, months and they calculate when they calculate the stable or increased odima free body weight and this is the formula to calculate uh, npna or it should be more than 0.8 grams per kg complete absence of clinical signs or symptoms attributable to odima detrimental effect of late reference usually most of the cases when they want uh, when they are having a renal failure or kidney failure they always are very uh, slow in uh, decision making they want to decide their own they want to take their own time inappropriate choice of mode of re- renal replacement therapy lack of uh, dialysis access but in the beginning they won't be having any access to dialyze them to putting put him on the machine delayed initiation of re- renal rep- replacement therapy that means when they first uh, uh, diagnosed with the kidney failure they always deny and uh, they, they want to delay for some more uh, months or some more uh, days so increased hosp- hospitalization by nauseated or uh, vomitings and low hemoglobins and um, and during this time also they will have a lot of people will die like the mortality rate will be increased and also the hospital charges will be increased and metabolic complications of uremia like uh, they always have high uremic before when you know when um, before going on the machine and malnutrition like uh, they don't want to feel like anything they don't want their food they don't want to eat anything so and they don't feel like eating any kind of food and sub optimal growth and development in the children if you see the in the children like their growth won't be much uh, if they have the renal failure in inadequate uh, psychological preparation of patients and family because uh, especially in india main main people like uh, even the middle class people can't afford the dialysis treatment like uh, the cost factor and everything and also social uh, psychologically social uh, uh, problems of the family and un- unemployment and economic hardship most of the people even the family sometimes they deny like uh, paying so much of uh, money for the treatment initiation of uh, renal replacement uh, therapy at the initiation of dialysis therapy all patients should have choice of modalities uh, individual clinical tolerance to high impaired renal functions exists in the range of 5 to 15 ml per minute creatinine clearance so that's where uh, when when it comes to this much the renal doctor will say that you need to be starting your dialysis and 
any kind of dialysis uh, soon. So the renal replacement therapy should be started timely and to avoid deterioration of the pa patient's health status, like their condition will be very um, sick and they might die. So the summary is the clinical indication, life-threatening situation, fluid overload, high potassium, uncontrollable of blood pressure and heart problems and neuropathies and mal malnutrition. Initiation of uh, re renal replacement therapy start before the com uh, complication occurs. That means, as I said, they won't, they are always uh, very slow in decision making when these kinds um, occur. Let, let re re reference to the kidney specialist or the nephrologist. So no choice of modalities, no dialysis access to start dialysis. That means I show you what it is. Deterioration of health status, for example, malnutrition. They don't want to eat anything. They will be very tired and very sick and increased ris risk of death. So, so what are the modalities of the renal replacement? Domography, treatment modalities, and the dialysis dosages. Worldwide, these are the percentage of the uh, uh, this uh, dialysis patient in USA and Canada and Asia Pacific. So, in hemodialysis, there are 89 percent. In PD, means this the peritoneal dialysis. There are about 11 percent, like like uh, in country wise. And in Asia, I think it's about 33 percent, you know, like Asia Pacific there are in the hemodialysis is about 91 percent and the peritoneal dialysis is 9 percent. In Latin America, you can see 73 percent of them are in hemodialysis and 27 percent of them are in hemodialysis. I'll explain to you what is uh, hemodialysis and other things shortly. So the wild, well, worldwide distribution of the end stage uh, renal pa uh, patients on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. If you see the similar patient survival with the hemodialysis and the peritoneal dialysis, like out of 100, the survival rate will be nearly 40 and lesser than 40 in the hemodialysis and the peritoneal dialysis. So, most dialysis patients are treated with hemodialysis, like either in the mm -hmm. uh, in-center hemo or the home hemodialysis, they treat by themselves. Or they can have a transplant, that's a kidney transplant, and or peritoneal dialysis. PD shows to tend to decline, like the graph shows, like uh, out of thousands, like hemodialysis patients and the peritoneal dialysis patients and the transplant. So the transplants are here, and the peritoneal dialysis will be here, and the hemodialysis will be here every, every thousand patients. So usually, who can go for the kidney transplantation uh, when they're having this kid, um, renal failure on the patients on the dialysis treatment. Like usually they prefer for the young people to um, have the transplant, like uh, um, transplant um, thing. So because uh, they don't have much of the problems like uh, obesity or uh, uh, diabetes or hypertension and everything. So they usually prefer uh, the younger, younger generation to, uh, instead of the old people like uh, to giving. So that treatment modalities, what are the kinds of treatments that can be given for the kidney failure patients? 
one is the peritoneal dialysis and the automated peritoneal dialysis that you can uh, dialyze at home uh, in the automatic like in the night time you can there's a machine and you can dialyze at home the other option is the hemodialysis or the hemofiltration this is a new kind of hemodialfiltration in the latest machines or uh, the other option if you don't want this is the kidney transplantation so so what are the advantages and disadvantages of the kidney transplantation so that, that means you are going to dialyze, dialyze for three times in a week so once you have a kidney transplant so you'll be free from dialysis improved well-being and improved rehabilitation improved survival that means if you look after yourself well and there won't be any dialysis once you have a kidney transplant and your well-being and improved rehabilitation like you can like uh, your uh, thing will get more improved there's also disadvantages of the surgery once you have a kidney transplant there's always a possible of rejection and also there will be a lot of uh, medication will be given to this called uh, immunosuppressive medication that means uh, anti rejection medication because the kidney is from somebody else so do, for that they give a high dosage of drugs for infections to to prevent infections and malignancies and osteopathy so to prevent that they give this immunosuppressants and also it's called as cyclosporin so the first uh, uh, form is the called uh, hemodialysis so that's what uh, i am doing at the moment so this hemodialysis is you can see here the dialyzer here and this called the extra corporal circuit is called the dialyzer and the circuit and this a monitor they monitor the pressure of the um, patient thing and the hydraulics are inside so there will be access form for the patient is called av fistula or a graft so av fistula is been created i'll show you soon it's called arteriovenous fistula so once they make an access they will be pumped to the machine about 300 to 350 mls per minute because in the normal body you can't pump the so much of blood each minute so they create an access to pump more blood i'll show you how to how they do that so the they call as arteriovenous fistula or the av fistula so usually they create in the rest or in the upper arm here so that allows permitting the blood flow of 200 to 400 ml per minute through the dialyzer so how do they do it they they take the arterial you know an artery at the vein they do the anastomosis and then so that the arterial blood will be pumped and create an access for the dialysis so, and then they're going to put into the machine and then one one end of the arterial blood will be given to the dialyzer and send it back to the the pure blood back will be so send it back to the uh, patient so during that we monitor the preparation of the handling the dialysate and and handling of used dialysate and the ultra filtration so what happens uh, during this dialysis there will be a lot of things uh, are taking place um, so this is the hd machine that i showed you before so this is the dialysate solution they keep here and and they monitor the um uh the patient for 4 to 5 hours each treatment so characters of hemodialysis 
low patient involvement during dialysis, close monitoring during dialysis in the in-center, and flexibility in dosing dialyzer treatment time, and disadvantage, like intermittent procedures, rapid uh, shift in the blood volume and body uh, fluid composition. Like when they're taking a lot of fluids, they, they, their blood pressure drops and they have a nausea and vomitings and interdialytic fatigue like that means once if the target weight today is about 60 kilos and the next treatment the patient because there was no urine output so what happens the patient drink fluids food and everything so they 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 have a fluid accumulated in the body so what happens here they remove the fluids from the blood to the extracorporeal circuit and the 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 fluid uh, which has been taken off from the body will be drained to the drain and the fresh blood will be returned to the body so there are three types of access like uh, uh, there's another access called um, the, uh, the graft access, so the arterial vena graft, there will be another polytetra um, material, synthetic material they will uh, operate and insert it here and and to the artery and the vein because of the their uh, veins not able to pump enough of blood. So, so that's called AV graft. And another type of uh, access is called uh, uh, catheter, perm cath or uh, uh, internal jugular, that's for the temporary purpose they use for internal jugular. Now, another form of uh, um, uh, blood access is called uh, catheterization. They do the catheter and they leave like um, for about six months or so um, for the dialysis access. Advantages, I mentioned to you like low patient involvement during dialysis, close monitoring during the in-center of the dialysis, flexibility of dosing. That means dialyzer, like if you're a small patient, they use the smallest dialyzer. And if you're a big and uh, patient and with uh, more fluid to remove, they use the bigger dialyzer. And the treatment time will be very disadvantages, like rapid shift in blood volume and the body fluid composition. When they're shifting very fastly, like they always have a you know, nausea and, you know, they were, they have low blood pressures and all, all sort of things. And technical, the machine, water supply, etc. the technical equipment, like I said, the machine, there'll be water called reverse osmosis water will be treated to that uh, machine. So anticoagulation necessary. So during this, uh, during this process, because the blood is running here for more than four to five hours through your extracorporeal circuit, so it might clot. So they give the anti-hypertensive, sorry, anti-coagulant medication called heparin. So the heparin will be going around the uh, since they are on the machine, uh, so that it helps not to clot the the circuit. The other form of uh, dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis. So this uh, kind of dialysis, you can do it at home. So that means, uh, so intracorporeal dialysis, that art as the blood pump, and peritoneum as a dialyzer, no machine is required and no anticoagulation is required. So what they do is uh, they they can, they, uh, they do a, catheterization here in the peritoneum and then they leave it and each time they have to um, hang a bag of the peritoneal dialysis fluid and insert into the uh, peritoneum and the, uh, the peritoneal dialysis solution to the peritoneum and after three to four hours you can drain the waste from there and to the drainage. So the peritoneum will act as a membrane 
So all the waste products from here will be drained back to the bank. So this is another form of uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. So that can be, you can concept dialysis 24 hours. You can walk around while it's happening. The peritoneal member works as a filter, like as a semi-permeable membrane. Manual changes of the fluids, like you can change it every four, four to five hours and depends on your blood chemistry. How many, like the doctor uh, will tell you how many, uh, uh, how many treatments you need uh, for, for a day. Like uh, usually they do four treatments, six treatments, it depends on their body weight and their blood chemistry. And there is another uh, cycle, this automatic cycle that can be done while you are sleeping. So it can say, like usually when they're nighttime, they check according to the, uh, you know, um, they do it automatically, the um, PD cycling machine. So characterize of peritoneal dialysis. Continuous gentle procedure, no rapid changes in blood volume and bloody fluid composition. No vascular access necessary like the dialysis access. Good for infants and patients with cardiac diseases. No extra corporal circuit, no bleeding risk, no blood contact and foreign materials. Better preservation of residual renal function. Improved patient survival when used at the first line modality. Home treatment, you can do it at home, this cycling, and no transport to the dialysis center is necessary. Like, uh, especially they, in India, many people can do, but uh, I'll tell you the other contraindications. So CAPD is less uh, expensive than the hemodialysis. So characteristics of uh, peritoneal dialysis, high motivation is uh, required, good knowledge of dialysis, inevitable with declining residu the residual renal function of CAPD or ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. So in this uh, peritoneal dialysis, there's a lot of uh, risk of infection like uh, peritonitis. Like uh, as I said, uh, here the catheter is situated when you're walking around, usually in India, it happens a lot like uh, when they, are, they don't look after uh, themselves, you know, they are not cleanly maintained like uh, hygiene wise, they always get the infections of the peritonitis. So, uh, so then they have to remove the catheter and form another kind of dialysis called uh, hemodialysis. So uh, there's a lot of risk of uh, infection called this peritonitis in the exit site in, uh, infections. And the membrane, once you get infection, there's a membrane failure and you won't get enough of uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis taking place. And you will have a burning out syndrome, risk of uh, mal, and you get sick again and you can't eat properly. And um, home delivery rooms for back, like uh, there is any, um, uh, they can't supply on time, the, mm -hmm. the delivery thing. So summary of the renal replacement modalities. So this best outcome is the kidney transplant, but there's a lot of uh, risk of infections, tumors, bone fractures. Not all the patients are el eligible for uh, transplantation. As I, as I said, like uh, the people with uh, high diabetes and heart problems, they are not uh, eligible for, and if they're having any other neurological problems or a uh, uh, lot of other infections and tumors and gangrenes and everything, they decline for the uh, kidney transplant because uh, they are high risk of rejection. The hemodialysis, most frequent modality, highly efficient but intermittent, risk of uh, interdialytic complications. Like once they come for dialysis, once they remove a lot of fluids, like usually they remove three to four liters of uh, fluid during hemodialysis. During hemodialysis, when they remove so much of fluids, once they finish, they will be very tired and they have low blood pressure problems and they can't drive. So they will, 
lot of complications after the dialysis also but not all of them but some in some cases so what they do is they the doctor will tell you to you know restrict all the fluids they will have about 500 to 700 ml per day so if they don't follow that so this kind of complication will will occur in peritoneal dialysis most frequently home dialysis modality low efficiency but continuous treatment as i said like there's a lot of risk of infections if they don't follow the proper uh, hygiene system and they can't go to swimming and they can't go to the pools uh, especially in the p when they carrying the catheters and also in the hemodialysis they also have a catheter you know to to maintain that even then they can't go to a swimming pool public swimming pool or uh, they can't make it wet or anything to so that they catch the infections thank you what is sir the surat sir hello and if there is any um, questions or anything like uh, i always uh, can e you can email me so i can um, email you back anything of uh, anything if i missed out in the questions you can ask the questions now if anybody wanted so what do you say that's right sir hello sir Sorry, I didn't see this one. Would like to know normal clearing levels of the females and black levels of B to B started. Usually, um, they start with the. Uh, Uh, serum uh, uh, serum creatinine levels more than 100 and um, 180 and above they um, they consider as the uh, uh, for the risk of the kidney failure so they need to check with the nephrologist or the specialist uh, uh, who is looking after that particular uh, patient about intake of water how much the water is sufficient and what extent to salt play part in damaging kidneys um but there seems to be a lot of inquiry um you you talking about the dialysis patients or the um or oh, before uh, damaging the kidneys um usually they restrict uh, to when once they diagnose the kidney failure the the nephrologist will restrict you to 7 grams per day in all kinds of food so there's no so, no there's no more than 7 grams uh, so they will restrict the um, uh, salt so that uh, to um, that might damage more um, kidneys hope it what are uh, OCs opportunities for uh, dialysis technologies. So, see, OCs, if, if they want to go OCs from uh, India, so the normal uh, procedure is they need to take the bonnet exams. That's called uh, board of uh, nephrology examinations for nurses and technologists. So, there's a board, uh, they conduct the exams. Uh, now they're conducting in Singapore. And uh, in Malaysia, I think last uh, few months back, they conducted in uh, Singapore and they postponed it. Every, every year they conduct in Singapore now um, for the, all the Asian um, thing. Um, I don't know about India, they are doing the bonnet exams or not. Um, I think they are conducting in Singapore and uh, Australia in Sydney and here in New Zealand and many parts of uh, America. So the 
board of uh, nephrology examinations for technologists and nurses are specialized for the dialysis so once you certified that so you can you can work anywhere in the world so once you certified you can work anywhere in the world as long as uh, you pass the exam and um, and also there is the requirements of those uh, country certificate as well like uh, we um, we formed a board in new zealand and australia called nzsarb that is new zealand and australia registered board for dialysis practitioners so we need to take up that exam and registered as a registered uh, renal technologist thank you any more question so what are the food and danger for the kidney health so every food is uh, danger for the kidney patients because uh, when when they are suffering from kidney uh, failure they can't uh, eat this they can't eat that like uh, the contains a uh, lot of uh, potassium and a uh, lot of uh, phosphate and everything so they always have to take the phosphate binders uh, uh, to control their uh, food and everything so um, because their kidneys are not functioning so there is always a, di- a danger in in um, uh food intake so the doctor salavi to take uh, less uh, sodium and also less uh, potassium diet uh, yeah, kind of thing so so they always uh, you know recommend from the dietitian uh, according to your blood chemistry what uh, uh, food do you have to take uh, what how much drink you have to drink because usually the kidney failure patient they won't pass urine so their blood will be uh, their fluid will be accumulated in the blood so they are restricted in the food and the water thank you how many years uh, the dialysis can be carried on so i have uh, seen the patients uh, more than 25 years uh, some are 40 years they look after themselves at home uh, i saw a patient uh, last uh, week uh, is dialyzing since 1972 so this almost nearly 48 years he is from sydney so he dialyzes at home and his wife is looking after him so he is happy so um, um they can be um, dialysis for 5 years if they can't look after especially in india uh, due to the even the lower middle class uh, people they can't uh, afford so they can't carry on uh, you know as long as uh, they are wealthy then it's okay but uh, usually the government facilities uh, in india is not so good they allowed only one treatment i understand i think uh, the maximum will be two treatments uh, for a week usually they need um, three treatments good five hours of dialysis for each patient in a week so that means monday wednesday friday or tuesday thursday saturday five times in a week they need to dialyze so especially in the government uh, facilities they don't have uh, much of uh, that uh, resources to you know so they do, they go for the private uh, in uh, india but usually they you know they can't uh, afford to go to the private clinics thank you mm-hmm. food so whatever uh, you like mainly is you know like as i said before like uh, diabetes and hypertension is the main causes of the kidney failure uh, so usually when you are diabetic like you need to follow the restricted uh, food when you controlling your um, um, you know uh, sugar levels and everything like this the main thing this this the main um, mm-hmm. um, problems in the kidney failure like the diabetes and the high blood pressures like uh, usually like uh, in our uh, people from indian subcontinent they won't follow even they are having high blood pressure they won't take uh, proper medication on time and uh, proper food on time and even if they are diabetic they eat 
all kind of foods and uh, you know um, high cholesterol diets and everything so you need to look after all those things thank you said patient required uh, any other parameters to be checked um usually the the this one of the creatinine level and the blood urea nitrogen is called bun that's also uh, the the parameter to check uh, for the uh, if the the nephrologist will check uh, before coming uh, to the if you are a kidney failure you know they diagnose as a kidney failure they do a test called isotope uh, test uh, so in that the in that they inject a medication called uh, uh, ihoxy the there's the chemical they inject to the blood stream and then they will uh, they will uh, monitor for uh, i think 24 hours in a uh, in a clinic and they check your scanning uh, um you know um for that test and and then they check the levels of the um glomerular functions and how the kidneys are functioning and how much urine output you get and how much is your creatinine levels and how much is your blood urea level like that hope it answers thank you ah yes um so this um, um there is evidence of uh, hereditary hereditary in many many countries like um they have uh, like uh, the grandparents uh, maybe having the kidney failure uh, polycystic kidneys or uh, Uh, like you, due to diabetes and everything like uh, i've seen many of them with the hereditary problems thank you yeah i already answered to that um, uh, question like uh, they think the normal uh, creatinine level is usually they uh, Uh, do the urine urine uh, sample like uh, 24 hours urine and uh, in that um, uh, when the creatinine is in the urine is high um, they do the they do the protein test uh, in the urine like uh, how much uh, protein uh, um, is being um, coming out in the blood oh, sorry in the urine um, and also the white or black cells in the urine um, in that uh, the uh, the these are the things they monitor uh, the nephrologist monitors that thank you once kidney transplant is done before the age 40 and it has been rejected within a year should that patient undergo dialysis till the yes, uh, organ donor so what is what's the frequency so once the kidney transplant is done before the and rejected okay yes um, and depends on um, the the your nephrologist they usually once once it's failure it's failure so there's no uh, there's no uh, other things so your urea level will go high you have a, you will be very tired and all your bit, blood chemistry will ha- will go high because it's rejected so um, so they usually go on dialysis thank you Any more questions? You can go for a word of thanks. If the...
Madam Stack, vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to all. Uh, Madam Stack, vote of thanks. A uh, very good afternoon to all. Honorable speaker of today's webinar, Sri Manjana Reddy, Management Committee. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Am I audible? Madam, start with start vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, Honorable Speaker of today's webinar, Shri Manjanath Reddy, Management Committee members, respected principal, Shri M.N. Basavaraju, sir, HOD of Zoology, Srimati Sagarika Kitpur Matman, HOD of other departments, my colleagues, uh, our most valued participants from other various institutions, uh, students. Uh, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. I, Poonima Hegde, on behalf of Zoology Department, SGRC College, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Sri Manjunath Reddy for the very informative and useful speech on the principles of dialysis. Uh, we are very thankful to you, sir, as much of what you spoke today is there for our final year students as syllabus. In a situation where uh, India has become the diabetes capital of the world, uh, a very informative speech on the relevant topic has helped today to almost all the um, uh, participants who have participated in this webinar. It was very useful. Uh, your uh, thorough explanation with regard to functions of the kidney, structure of the nephron, renal function, how to diagnose renal status, uh, acute uh, renal failure, chronic renal, uh, renal failure, absolute indications for initiation of uh, dialysis, uh, detrimental effects of late uh, referral, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, kidney transplant, advantages and disadvantages of kidney transplant. Everything was extremely helpful, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I extend my sincere thanks to the management committee members uh, Dr. Vedamurthy and Sri Nandish sir for their support in all our ac academic endeavors. The program's credit goes to our beloved principal, Sri M.N. Basavaraju, who is the brainchild behind today's webinar. A heartfelt thanks to you, sir. And thanks to our HOD madam, Sagarika Kiturmat, for her timely coordination. Today's webinar would not have been success without the technical support And thanks to all the participants for distinguished professors, students, researchers, and other interested scientific tempered individuals. Your participation has led to the success of today's webinar. Thank you one and all. Okay, thank you, Trish.